Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. Before we begin, I want to thank all the patrons who have helped make videos like this one possible. If you are new to my channel or know my work for my videos, documentaries, video essays, or anything else, thank you for watching. I've recently begun working on in-depth videos like this one full-time and it's thanks to generous patrons and donators that I can delve so deeply into topics and stream as a full-time endeavor. So if you enjoy this video, please consider giving me a few dollars at the links down below to help me pay bills and keep eating food. With the obligatory shilling out of the way, let's get right into the video. Matt Walsh has been something of a rising star in the conservative media space in the last few years. During his time at the Daily Wire, he's even somewhat managed to eclipse the outlet's own editor, Ben Shapiro, in the mainstream zeitgeist due mostly to his What is a Woman documentary in 2022. And while that video was many's first exposure to Matt, it wasn't for me. Uh, no, I've been hate following Matt Walsh all the way back to his days as a blogger. So when everybody else was rightfully calling him out on his transphobic trolling, I saw the same patterns he's been repeating for far longer. Even as someone who keeps tabs on most mainstream and conservative commentators, Matt has gained his own unique spotlight with this incendiary transphobic comments and intentionally obtuse arguments. Matt Walsh isn't unique in that way, but what is unique is that unlike contemporaries like Crowder, Shapiro, or Poole, his blogging has given the world a look into his worldview for years. Now, it exists as kind of a, a mental map, a chart of the mind palace of a bigot. We can use it to see what's important to him, how he sees the world. Since 2013, Matt's blog quietly gave an intimate look into his life as a young conservative father, allowing him an outlet for every perceived slight and petty grievance. And a few years later, his video blogging on The Matt Walsh Show only helped grow his audience. As a result, Matt Walsh's body of work now exists as a nearly comprehensive compendium of who he is and how his mind works, well beyond the more refined professional image he puts forward for The Daily Wire nowadays. But why make a video discussing Matt Walsh so thoroughly? I mean, you could easily look at any of Matt's videos and show how he's little more than a vindictive and spineless bully. Well, it's because Matt Walsh isn't unique. In fact, he's representative of a growing population of vocal conservatism, one that doesn't care about respectful politics or bipartisanship, but outright advocates suppression of their enemies and extra-legal and often violent suppression of anything they disagree with. And if you truly want to fight back against something, I've always found it best to understand it. To take apart a machine and understand how every piece works in conjunction with one another. Because as I've watched countless hours and read through five years of Matt Walsh's blog, I've come to realize that Matt Walsh isn't complicated or nuanced, but the way he structures his arguments and how he avoids criticism can give him the appearance of being superior, at least to his followers. The reality that I'll come to show, however, through this tiered breakdown of Matt is that he's little more than a sad, frustrated man who is driven by spite, yet of all the hatred he espouses, I don't think there are many people Matt hates more than himself. But before we dive headfirst into the shadows of Matt's mind palace, Let's go back to the beginning. Matt Walsh isn't a very interesting person. His history and how he got to his station are fairly benign affairs, for example. And as we'll see later, his tastes and the things he appreciates are likewise fairly bog standard. And on the off chance Matt or any of his fans or followers see this video, I'd entreat them to not resort to their regular cynicism and sarcastic approach to critique that they so often resort to, but instead seriously address what I'm saying and how I'm wrong if you think that's the case. Matt is a professed lifelong Catholic who grew up in the church. By his own testimony, he fell away from the church during his young adulthood and later came back to it after starting a family. Yeah, I, uh, well, as far as faith, I, I was raised uh, Catholic, devout Catholic by a devout Catholic family. But I had a, a period, like a lot of people do, when I was in my, when I was in my uh, late teens and early 20s where I sort of, uh, I always believed, I didn't, I didn't leave the faith per se, but I, wasn't, I certainly wasn't living according to it. Mm -hmm. um, but then I, you know, I used to get married and, and start having a family. That's when I, I started to realize that I need to take this stuff actually seriously. Um, become, it becomes real for you mm -hmm. in a way that maybe it's not when you're just a single guy in your early 20s living you know, in, a, in your one-bedroom apartment. So. 
In brief, he started as a shock jock on a local radio station around 24, roughly six years after graduating high school. As Matt would later write, he sidestepped any kind of college education. In his blog post, Thank God I Wasn't College Material, he writes authoritatively on an experience he never had, stating, quote, People go to college. It's what people do. Why do they go? Because they need to. Why do they need to? Because it's what people do. Why? Because they need to. And so on. This was in response to a teacher trying to help him find a path in life using creative writing. It seems that from a young age, Matt has, at least according to him, been smarter than nearly everyone around him. But don't worry, there are plenty more examples of that ahead. Now, Matt's history with education is very important to understanding who he is and why he is that way, but we'll dive into that in a bit. There's a lot to cover here, and as a wise man once said, don't cross the streams. Don't cross the streams. Why? It would be bad. I also want to be clear that I have nothing against people who don't go to college or even people who finish high school. If there's one thing I agree with Matt on, it's the basic idea that not all education fits all people. But Matt has a very specific chip on his shoulder that takes this idea and twists it into justification for his ignorance and incuriosity, which we will get to shortly. But back to the shock jock era. Infamously, as was reported by Ari Drennan for Media Matters, during this time, Matt also professed ideas like 16-year-olds being mature enough to have babies and basically being adults. Uh, even biologically, and this is me just stating, I'm just right now I'm gonna start by just stating facts. So fact number one, it's not a new phenomenon. Fact number two, in fact, it's a phenomenon that was more common earlier in history and for you know, the first six to 10,000 years of human existence, it was a normal thing. Uh, fact three, Girls between the ages of like 17 and 24 is when they're technically most fertile. Yeah. Okay? That's biological. That's a fact. All right? I'm just stating facts. That's all I'm doing. On the Matt and Crank program, Matt and his co-host performed all kinds of juvenile and lurid pranks in attempts to garner attention. I don't want to harp too hard on most of these because they were very much the kind of edgy, stupid humor that appealed to many young men in the late 2000s and early 2010s. And I don't think there's a lot of value in trying to cancel an entire generation of frat bros who thought South Park was cutting edge humor. But this platform, while allowing Matt to also indulge in this random cruelty and basic observational humor, also gave Matt an opportunity to espouse his political views, which he did often. But it is in fact true that you have to make people hurt. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but holding signs and uh, yelling loudly will not make anyone hurt and it's not going to get anything changed. Uh, calling your congressman probably makes you feel good about yourself and I'm very happy for you, but that doesn't really get anything done. And you're not going to change the system by calling a congressman and you're not going to change the system by voting out a few incumbents. And you're not going to change the system by voting in Republicans. I think we're at the point now where we have to purge the system of all parties. One of the more interesting aspects of Matt during these shock jock years is that, as we'll see, he hasn't changed much since. Sure, he's swapped his raggedy t-shirt and stubble for a generic suit and an ill-fitting beard, but by and large, his opinions seem to have remained the same. He's nothing if not consistent. Uh, for example, he's always been transphobic, as evidenced by this bizarre screed in 2011. If you're trying to express your inner self, why is it always the same as everyone else's inner self? Is also needing to express. And okay, so in a cross-dressing guy, it's always, it always looks like a, like a housewife from a far side cartoon. It's always, it's always the same. You know what I'm talking about? It's always like beehive do and they're just completely ridiculous. Just, it's, I don't know. I don't know where they get their, it's, they gotta, especially the cross-dressers, they have to kind of, I don't know where they get their notions of femininity from is what I'm saying. It's not, it's never like a sporty girl that, that, that wears like jogging outfit and kind of has a ponytail. It's are always they, just overdone. Just Are they going for feminine now or are they just going for some weird hybrid? They are weird hybrid themselves. They're supposedly going for femininity, but they gotta, you know, flip to maybe the style section of the paper, not the, not the, not the comics. Matt also exhibited a lot of racism. This particular clip, where the hosts are debating whites becoming a minority in America, is interesting for how the other host continues to try pushing back against Matt, who repeatedly runs into white replacement paranoia and edges the 14 words with reckless abandon. But the point is, you see how, um, and, and we've heard this before, Maybe this is more dramatic than what we've heard in the before. And when no one's actually said it's over for us, we're done. Our uh, our race of people, uh, we're, we're we're singing our swan song right now. We're the last of the Mohicans, the last of the Anglo's, and that's what's happening with us. The extinction of the Anglo-Saxon race is uh, is 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 just like that. Well, now the solution is pretty simple. It's just uh, the solution is to freaking reproduce and have kids but, and have families. But I, well, I know what you're saying, but it's a little bit different because. I, I just think people are less racist than they used to be, and so they're not just going after, I'm a white guy, I'm gonna get me a white girl. But when, when you don't have kids and when you don't reproduce and when you've decided 
that it's more important for you to just get into your career and then when you're in your 40s maybe you'll think about it when, when you do that, that that's a dying race dying races are old and and impotent and right now the white race at least the western white race is old and impotent impotent i don't really think about it as i don't know okay so what there's not going to be a whole bunch of white people I, yeah, what, because what? because don't you agree that america when the mexican people come here which is fine that they want to come as long as they come legally which most of them aren't but uh, they bring with them, being that they are a different culture, a different right. race, and everything. Else, they bring with them an identity, and they and they and they bring it to America. And so, as the Anglo Saxons, which were the original Americans, die off, our identity and our culture goes with it. All of this took place from 2010 through 2011. Now, you might hear a lot of this rhetoric and think, "Gee, this sounds eerily similar to a lot of modern alt-right talking points like Great Replacement Theory." Which is true. The thing is, the alt-right wasn't really a thing in 2011. Talking points like the Great Replacement were commonplace among conspiracy of right, led by voices like Glenn Beck at the time. It would be years until people like Stephen Molyneux and Lauren Southern would push those talking points more into the mainstream. During this tirade, he also calls Anglo-Saxons the original Americans, which is not true. Uh, Anti-nativism is another feather in Matt's ignorance cap. As part of the duo's prank calls, Matt Walsh also called Obama Elementary School, putting on a very racist affect that recalls Steven Crowder's infamously racist impressions years later. But then I've been waiting this whole time to say, wait till they open up a school named after Barack Obama, wait till they open a Barack Obama school that he's running, you know, because I know that he's going to be down with that because I could even imagine a situation where he would say, look, uh, you ain't really get a good grade. This other dude over here got a good grade, but we can combine y'all two grades, you know, and make a and make an average grade and then dispense it equally, you know, proportion. So I just want to make sure that's the way y'all run things over there, uh, so I can. No, no not in terms of the grading. I mean, every student would earn their individual grade. That's the grade that they would be given. Yeah, but that, that don't. I mean, but then why? You know, I ain't trying to put you on spot because huh? I know I know you don't make these decisions. But why would y'all name yourself after Barack Obama when, when we know that his policy was really, you know, I'm gonna try to spread that around to anybody who ain't really got none. You know, I'm gonna try to spread that that around that wealth and that and, and whatnot. Like I said, Matt's views haven't changed really. It wasn't the primary focus of his work as a shock jock, but he couldn't help but be incendiary. Wherever he got his rhetoric from, it's pretty clear that Matt believed in some pretty racist shit, like white settlers' superiority over indigenous people, the stupidity and illiteracy of black people, and that he bought into paranoia and fears about the erasure of white or Anglo-Saxon culture. All things he still soaks fears about today, by the way. His shock jock career ended abruptly, with Matt seemingly mysteriously fired. He moved to Kentucky, where he had a show on WGMD 92.7. It was a small Christian conservative station where Matt kept a low profile and worked less than a year before hopping over to another show he worked in 2012 until it was canceled. In November of 2012, he started a blog where he would write about petty grievances until 2018. In 2013, Matt joined Glenn Beck's network, The Blaze, where he would cross-post his blog posts as editorials on whatever minute grievances he would get worked into an overworded, needlessly verbose tizzy about. And he posted a lot. In his early days, according to the archive of his blog on the website, sometimes he'd post multiple times a day. From here, he basically had his back door into the conservative space. He had always been someone willing to make fun of others for attention or shield controversial beliefs for a spotlight, as shown as his days on morning radio. But The Blaze and his blog gave him a bigger platform to spread his purposefully incendiary rhetoric. Matt Walsh's ascent to a figurehead of right-wing reactionary movements isn't surprising. He's not a particularly charismatic speaker. He doesn't have a real wit or way with metaphor or analogy, but he is competent. And... That is enough to set him apart in a sea of conspiracists and blowhards while also giving his audience a false sense of confidence for echoing his beliefs. He speaks gratingly with an authoritative verve, a false sense of self-assurance that whatever he says is objectively correct, which in turn helps his audience feel secure in trusting him at the conclusions he draws about the world around him. Many of these same qualities are easily identifiable in other conservative talking heads like Nick Fuentes and Jordan Peterson. It doesn't matter so much what they say or if they have any proof, it's how they say it that seems to lend them credence. But more than that, Matt rose to prominence because of the way he eschewed mainstream conservative talking points, bypassing the decorum of an older conservatism that at least tried to publicly respect others instead of outright bullying his subjects, most often with broad generalizations. It's why he so comfortably seemed to move from morning zoo crew prank calls to daddy blogging. They both gave him the ability to belittle others, something he seems to have always relished. Like I said, consistency. 
I would never call Matt Walsh a grifter um, because of his history. Unlike Candace Owens or other right-wingers who have jumped onto the profitable bandwagon because they couldn't make other careers work, Matt Walsh is a true believer. He believes in what he says. His opinions haven't changed since his early 20s as proof. But what does he really believe? And what does it say about how he sees the world? Let's really dig into that gray matter and find out in his own words. When I set out to make this video, I plan to go down the list of what Matt believes and how he justifies it all to create a roadmap of what he actually believes in. The problem is those questions are easily answered. He mostly believes in anything that makes him feel inherently superior. Though I want to preface this by saying Matt Walsh, while often espousing his beliefs as inherently better, both seriously and sarcastically, has a defined streak of self-dislike. It mostly comes out when he's talking about self-image. He doesn't see himself as good looking, for example. The pressure to be beautiful is not something that I myself have really experienced. And thank God for that, because obviously I missed the beauty train and it ain't coming back to pick me up. So it's good that it doesn't, it doesn't matter for me. And so I'm a man and I'm also married. So I really don't care. It doesn't matter to me. <laughs> I mean, people in the comments will make, uh, I'll see sometimes they'll make, they'll make very insulting remarks about my physical appearance. And you know what? Anytime I read those, the only thing I, I just smile and I think, well, it's a good thing I'm married then. So I don't care. I mean, it really doesn't, really doesn't make a difference. Um, I just feel bad for my wife, honestly. Now, I'm not in the habit of passing judgment on people based on their looks because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Matt Walsh isn't really my type to begin with. Too much beard and bigotry. But if you saw Matt Walsh on the street just walking by and didn't know who he was, he just looks normal. He, he has a face. He has a head. He just looks like a guy. Yet this self-depreciating streak, especially when it comes to his looks, pops up quite a bit, and it's something to keep in mind. But back to the main quest. The more insightful question I found in going through Matt's blog wasn't what he believed, but how his mind worked to believe it. Like Ben Shapiro, Dennis Prager, Jordan Peterson, and many others, Matt would have his viewers believe his ideas are based in fact. But they're not. Not really. Matt's ideas seem to be solely based on the ever-present belief that he is always right simply because... He is. Like other commentators, he uses words like facts, logic, and reason as crutches for his arguments because if he didn't constantly use them to prop up what he was saying, there would be no reason to find him trustworthy at all. He rarely cites sources and mostly relies on broad generalizations. And I don't mean he actually uses facts, logic, and reason. No, just literally those words. Like, he just says them and thinks that makes him right. For example, Let's look at a video blog where Matt makes the scientific case for Christ using entirely circular logic. He starts by saying that science cannot disprove God. Let's start with one basic principle here. Science cannot disprove God, okay? It cannot disprove the supernatural by definition. Uh, science is a thing for the natural realm. The claim of a Christian or of any theist is that there's also a supernatural realm, which science can't tell you anything about. But then Matt makes the argument that God is the reason why things like science and math work. And because I'm trying not to not make the kind of self-evident arguments Matt relies on, no, that's not why science and math work. The, they work because humans have spent thousands of years working on them. God didn't come up with the theory of relativity Einstein did. After hundreds of years of work, that led up to his own. Ironically, Matt uses Einstein as part of his proof. So you cannot disprove God by applying the rules of the physical world to him. He sets those rules. And, and the, fact, the fact that the rules are so orderly, the fact that you can do mathematics and you can do physics and you can work out equations and calculations and learn about the world, um, and it all makes so much sense, that is evidence for God, not against him. You know, there's that famous Einstein quote where he said the, the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it is comprehensible. So he was speaking about the incredible order and discernibility of the universe, um, which is not what you would expect. If we're talking about a random universe that was just uh, that came out of nothing and came out of chaos, you would not expect a universe that has ordered itself like this, a universe that can be understood, a universe that follows certain firm laws. And from there, he pivots to a reason for believing in God, and his proof is the Apostle Paul converting to Christianity. For those who don't know, Paul was a former anti-Christian named Saul who had a vision on the road to Damascus and became one of the most fervent preachers in early Christianity afterwards, which is all well and good as a historical figure, but as evidence for God, there's a lot to question with Matt's approach. Paul himself, his story, um, what he did, his, his own biography is, is even more compelling evidence. Because we know that he was a very strict Jew 
who originally considered the Christians to be, to be heretics. Um, he helped to round them up and execute them. But something happened. Something quite sudden occurred, and then he changed. There was a change in him. And he went from a persecutor of the followers of Christ to persecute it in the name of Christ. Now, how do we account for that as a skeptic? If you're a skeptic, how do you account for that? I, I haven't really heard an even halfway convincing argument. The best you can do to try to explain, you've got this guy, persecutor of Christians, um, strict observant Jew, who comes to believe that Jesus rose from the dead uh, and then goes and travels around the region preaching this, putting his life in jeopardy, writing these letters. How do you explain that if, 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 if the resurrection never occurred? The best you can do, I think your only recourse really, is, is to claim that Paul was just a madman, that he was a lunatic. And this is just one example. There are no end to the arguments Matt has made that use his own self-contained circular logic, which isn't too bad of a thing on its own. I think a lot of people have different ways of making sense of things like history, faith, and the world we live in. But that makes for opinion, not compelling fact. Even if Matt wants to say he's used logic, he doesn't seem to realize that logic is internal to himself. More than his need to be right, Matt has a strange fixation with definitions. And what is a woman might pop into your head, but it's an argument style Matt has adopted for his entire career, where he needs words to have very plain, simple definitions, otherwise he's left questioning the point of everything around it. So we need to know who we are, um, and then we need to know our purpose. You know, we need purpose. We need some idea as to why we are here. Even if I know who I am, now I need to know why I am, and where I'm going. And this deep desire for purpose and for meaning, that's what separates us from animals. Some examples include things like standards of beauty. And we say that everybody should think that they themselves are beautiful. Well, everyone isn't beautiful, first of all. There's a certain objective quality to physical beauty. If there isn't any, I know people say, no, there's no objective quality to beauty. Well, then it doesn't mean anything. And art. But most art today has no connection to anything real, and instead it exists for its own sake. It exists only to distract. It exists to appeal to the basest parts of us. And I think that that certainly does hurt our souls, as well as our brains. Definitions around biology. All right, stoicism, competitiveness, aggression are harmful traits now. The problem, of course, is that these have been male traits since time immemorial, since the beginning of time. Now, psychologists and psychiatrists, they try to flip this around, and it's kind of a chicken or egg thing. So what they'll say is that, well, no, you see, society decided that men were supposed to be stoic and competitive and, and aggressive, and so then little boys grow up and they see what society is saying, and they try to conform themselves um, to those expectations. But actually, you see that? And that, this is what you get from psychologists and psychiatrists and the you know, so-called mental health experts. You get these, they make these proclamations that are, that are ideological, philosophical, theoretical. What they aren't is scientific. It seems very rare these days that you hear anything actually scientific from these people. These, they just, they, they make these, they just declare these things about how people work, how men work, how women work, how people are supposed to be, how society is supposed to be. And we all just listen to them unquestioning. Um, because they have a, they have an MD or whatever. Well, actually, psychologists don't even have MDs. Um, or psychiatrists don't have MDs, but I forget which one it is. But it, it doesn't matter. This, that is, that's not a scientific, uh, um, you know, uh, conclusion. Because the fact is it goes the other way around. Men are just naturally more competitive, competitive, uh, more aggressive, less emotional. That's how men have always been. It's biological. It's ingrained. He also has a weird thing with defining hate crimes, which he just doesn't seem to understand that hate can mean based in something emotional or external. Like hating someone based on race or religion is a different kind of hate from hating the way someone chews with their mouth open or listens to music in public without headphones. Well, hate speech is a nonsensical, ambiguous phrase by design. It's ambiguous because the people who use it want to be able to apply it to whatever, right? So it's a lot like a hate crime in that case. In fact, let's step to the side for a minute because I think it helps us to understand hate speech. Let's, let's start, but let's, let's think about hate crime, okay, first of all. The whole problem with a hate crime, with, with the category of hate crime, is that any crime could be motivated by hate. It doesn't make any sense to say, well, we have this special category of crime of, that's motivated by hate. That any, almost any crime that's ever been committed in the history of mankind could have had some hatred involved in it, right? Or maybe not. And you can't really know whether there was hatred behind the crime or not. It's something that if you just know Matt from his transphobic screeds and what is a woman, you don't really understand about his work. The extent to which Matt relies on simplistic definitions, and more importantly, grows visibly frustrated by a lack of them, is integral to how he sees and reacts to the world around him. A world that, no matter 
what politics you align with is anything but simple. And for Matt, this obsession with definitions can often be multi-layered. As in, if he doesn't understand one thing meaning another, it informs his understanding of several things. Look, for example, at how his understanding of gender seems to inform a sense of purpose that he would derive from it. We have this idea that we have to change the definition of masculinity because so many men today fall short of that definition, and so therefore it needs to change. But is that the right response? I would say no, it isn't. I would say that actually that's the whole reason why we shouldn't change it. The fact that men are falling short of it is all the more reason to reassert the definition, to strengthen it, fortify it, to, to declare it from on high. It's not why you should change it. The fact that people are falling short of the definition proves the necessity of the definition. And masculinity for men, just like femininity for women, has helped to answer some very important questions. Like, what are men supposed to do? What are women supposed to do? How are men supposed to act? How are women supposed to act? Men and women in society have always asked these questions about themselves. People will always look at themselves and wonder, what am I supposed to do? What is my role? What is my, what is my place in society? But by getting rid of masculinity and femininity, all we've done is we've removed the, the answer to the question, but we have not removed the question. People are still asking the question, but all you've done is you've taken away the answer, which means that now there's going to be confusion. There's going to be paralysis where there used to be clarity and action. Every man, not, not every man protects his family, but every man should protect his family. Again, not just physically, but spiritually. These are, yes, not every man does it. Not every man wants to do it, but every man should do it and they should all want to do it. They should. That's the standard that they should aspire to. When you take the standard away, now we have nothing to aspire to. We have nothing to strive towards. You know, we say that we are changing the definitions of things so that people can be different. Like we, 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 we look at a, a feminine man and we see that he's different than other men. And so we say, well, we need to change the definition of masculinity in order to accommodate this guy. But when you change the standard by which the difference is judged and by which the difference is recognized as a difference, then you've gotten rid of the difference. And so you've actually, by kind of expanding all definitions and opening everything up in this, in this effort to, to welcome diversity, you've actually abolished diversity. Now nobody can be different because there's nothing to be different in comparison to. These preoccupations with definitions and logic might seem inconsequential, but they form the basis of most of Matt's arguments. Arguments that generally only take a few forms. Having watched more hours than someone ever should and read through his entire blog, Matt doesn't have a whole lot of rhetorical strategies. He repeats his approaches ad nauseum, and they're all in service of helping him feel superior, smarter. I'll list some of them now, and when they inevitably show up in this video, I'll note them on screen. And in case you think I'm being too harsh or overly reductive, go ahead and apply this rubric to literally any Matt Walsh argument or video. If you're here to defend Matt, for example, really consider these arguments the next time you hear him make them. Just forgive my silly names for them. I have a general disdain for the pedantic arguments like straw man or ad hominem, and some of Matt's don't directly correlate to those. So to avoid the nerds in the comments going, well, um, actually, I've just decided to make my own silly names. Matt loves to appeal to logic. After making an argument, he will often claim it's just science or failing that his argument is based on common sense or reason. Matt loves to take a complicated issue and compare it to an issue that is much less complicated, thus making his position appear more rational, when really he's just making a comparison that doesn't make much sense. Matt hates being criticized, but when he's directly criticized for something, he rarely tries to disprove it. In fact, his usual approach is to cover his tracks in sarcasm, like Batman throwing down a smoke pellet. This is what I call it when Matt reduces an entire thought process to something easy for him to understand. Even if it's more nuanced than that, Matt loves to flatten entire viewpoints, especially when they oppose him. This is easily observable whenever he talks about Democrats or the left, where he will make the broadest claims like, the whole left is celebrating dead babies because one celebrity talked about their abortion, or that the entire Democrat party wants to trans your kids because Dems were at some point defending trans healthcare. This isn't an original approach for right-wingers, but it's one of the only things Matt has. By his own attesting, Matt can be a fairly angry person. Um, for instance, one of my many personal flaws is that I have a bad temper, okay? Uh, so I'm telling you a lot about it. I mean, I'm obese, I have a bad temper. For, for instance, uh, you know, so, but, but as someone with a bad temper, I know it shocks you to learn that about me. I know that I need to change that. And that's a flaw that I have. I need to work on. It's something he's talked about working on, which is good for him but that anger does come through in his writing and speaking, namely in the ways he likes to name call and belittle others. Bullying, for lack of a better term. Something he relies on especially when cornered. Along with his sarcastic streak, these are his primary methods of deflecting criticism. Rarely does he meet them head on. 
You can easily see all of these tactics in any of Matt Walsh's modern content. He's a creature of habit and rarely moves from his comfort zone, evidenced by a nearly year-long streak of content on a show almost exclusively focusing on coronavirus lockdowns. You might look at these approaches in a vacuum and think, so what? Matt Walsh is an insecure baby who can't handle criticism and doesn't know what he's talking about. And sometimes I'd say that's correct. But I think that's only half the story. It's how his arguments work, but not the why. For me, I think the why is possibly the more interesting point, especially if we want to understand why someone who is technically well-spoken and articulate becomes such a vicious bigot. Put more simply, how does someone who is technically intelligent sound so stupid? Remember when we talked earlier about Matt skipping college? His nearly lifelong attesting that college is useless continues today, but he speaks on the subject with such a specific venom, a venom that's often combined with criticism of how education treats people, specifically people like him. And by that, I mean male and introverted. At the end of 12 or 13 years in the education system, a kid will have a tiny bit of knowledge on many subjects. Um, he will not be competent in any of them. He will have no area of expertise or specialty or special interest. And then he will go to college as a kind of blank slate, which is how it's designed. That's what the colleges want, right? And, um, and he'll have no idea what he's good at, no idea what he cares about, no real idea what his interests are. And he'll decide sort of randomly then what his major is going to be. And at the end of four years, five years of college, he'll be 22, 23, 24 years old with still a very shallow but broad base of knowledge, no expertise, no skills, no special interest. And, and his one area of more in-depth knowledge, his major, will be maybe an area that he doesn't even care about uh, because he picked it arbitrarily and without knowing anything about it before he chose it. When I was in school, I, I, I realized very early on that I was specially interested in writing and history. I also realized that I was specially terrible at math and I hated it and, and with a passion. Um, and I was, you know, it just did not click for me. It clicked you know, up through arithmetic and the really basic stuff. It clicked, click, click. Once we started getting into algebra and things like that, that's when it, it, it left me behind and I did not have the brain for it. Um, whereas I can remember even being in, in you know, in a, a much younger student and looking around at some of my, some of my fellow classmates who seemed to struggle with writing and reading and things like that. And um, it was hard for me to like, how could you struggle with this? Is this like how? And I would see kids who were really brilliant at math and seemed to be very smart, but then it's like they, they write, they were, I, you know, I'd see how they were writing at a level that was um, three or four steps below where I was. And that's how people are, you know? Those, there, were, there were the subjects that I, were, that I was really interested in and I really cared about and I was good at. In, in an education system that's effective and in an education system that is set on creating the kind of people that Dennis Prager wants and that I want and that most of us want, uh, in that kind of system, I would have been able to double or triple up on, on the subjects that I really cared about, dive into them, explore my interests in those areas, develop those skills, learn those subjects. And at the end of my time in school, I would have a, a deep base of knowledge, a deep reservoir of knowledge on a few subjects. And I would then have the beginnings of a skill and a vocation and a calling, right? Um, most people, unless you're Leonardo da Vinci, unless you are a historic genius, most people are never going to have a deep reservoir of knowledge on every subject. The most you can hope for to be a really competent, interesting, interested, um, successful, knowledgeable, smart person. For, for most people like that, it's, you, have, you, have, you have that deep base of knowledge on a few subjects. For example, this section where he talks about college as if he's been there, mischaracterizes it, and then says if education worked, you'd be able to learn the meaningful things that mattered to you. My dude, that's college, where you go to learn the things you want to learn. But this is far from the only time he's brought up his ill-fitted early education. Despite often swinging for the fences on big conservative issues like abortion rights and anti-trans and anti-gay agendas, one of Matt's other longtime fixations has been high school education and how it disservices American kids. But unlike those issues, Matt does so from a place of first-hand experience. An experience that not only makes him more genuinely passionate about the issue, but one that resonates with me personally because it's very similar to my own. And to fully understand this particular rabbit hole, I'm gonna have to cover two distinct reasons Matt gets so passionate, his introversion and ADHD. Introversion first. In addition to qualifying himself as an extremist, I'll get to that in a sec, and adequately educated, Matt Walsh is self-professed to be an introvert. In a blog post complaining about teachers trying to get kids to be social, Matt relays his wisdom to the educators of the world that sometimes Kids are just different, and sometimes being an introvert is okay. While this blog post acts like it's about something, it becomes clear that it's just Matt's ever-present persecution complex setting in because he seems himself as an introvert. There's the same defensive sarcasm he constantly employs, but there's 
a more vicious sentiment behind it, something that rears its head again and again on this subject. I'm not making any armchair diagnoses, but Matt seems to have a history of taking criticism of introversion in particular as an incredibly personal attack. Quote, Indeed, many of the greatest inventors, engineers, creators, thinkers, writers, artists, and revolutionaries have possessed the apparently defective trait of introversion. Einstein, Newton, Yeats, Proust, Shakespeare, Orwell, Edison, Plato, Bill Gates, all introverts, and all incredibly successful because of this trait, not in spite of it. Today I'm sure we'd tell Newton to come out of his shell, we'd be offended by Plato because he doesn't want to stop to talk about the weather every time we pass him in the hall. I'm sure Edison's teachers would recommend a daily dose of psychotropic medication to cure him of his antisocial disorder." End quote. To say nothing of how Matt seemingly puts himself in league with great thinkers here, this feels more like a cry for teachers to just let kids be introverted if they want to be. Fair dues. But his preoccupation with being an introvert and how he feels he's treated because of his introversion has continued for years beyond schooling. Uh, that's what I discovered was the case for me. In fact, I discovered that when I was in, still in grade school. Um, and I realized that this kind of sitting down, having someone regurgitate information, and then I have to regurgitate it onto a sheet of paper to show that I've picked on. But it's, it's, very, it's very focused on memorization, um, and you're only learning about this subject for a, a, a certain amount of time, and then you got to move on to this subject and everything. And just that whole, there are some people who excel in that environment and do very well in it. Um, but there are also some people who just don't. And it's not because they're stupid, it's not because they can't learn, it's just because they learn differently. Being an introvert means that you draw energy from quiet, from solitude, from being alone with your thoughts and your imagination. You like silence, you like to think. Um, interacting with people drains you. We are up in our heads all the time, constantly. And we like that, you know, we like to be there thinking and imagining and wondering, whatever. It's not a self-absorbed thing, it's not like we're always thinking about ourselves. We could be thinking about anything. We could be thinking about the news or about a family member or about God or about walruses. I mean, really, who knows? We could be thinking about anything. But if you rip us out of that, then we prefer it if you have a good reason. The moment you start talking to us, you have ripped us out of our, out of our thought process. I've already explained that we're up in our heads all the time. And um, that means that we're very analytical about things. So we analyze everything. We especially analyze human interactions. So we will leave every small talk conversation, analyzing and assessing our own performance in the exchange. While the extrovert may leave the exchange and just go about his day and not think about it anymore, for us, we're left thinking about it, inspecting ourselves, giving ourselves a grade on the whole thing. Usually it'll be a pretty poor grade. Although sometimes we'll walk away saying, oh, you know, wow, well, well done, me. That was, pretty, you know, I guess that was a B plus small talk performance. Well done. And then we have to go take a nap because we're so drained and exhausted by it. This is mostly self-aggrandizing Sigma male adjacent nonsense, but it does give an important bit of info. Matt Walsh, for all his issues, is introspective. He does think about his flaws. I can't say how deeply, but he does. And before moving on, I want to put in one other curious clip of reflection by Matt, because I think it's very important. Of course, Matt thinks we have a growing culture of vanity due to rampant social media consumption. But listen to how he describes the idea of being so stuck in your head and how it leads to noticing your own flaws and how social media fuels our narcissism and causes us to think about ourselves, focus on ourselves in inordinate amount. And this is where a lot of the self-esteem issues come from. Now, it's not that, we, it's not that we, we think badly about ourselves in this culture. It's, that, it's just that we think about ourselves way too often. We spend way too much time thinking about ourselves. And when we do that, of course, we're going to notice our flaws. And of course, we're going to be obsessed with those flaws because we're obsessed with ourselves. And then we, and then we, we chalk that up to a self-esteem problem when really it's a, it's, a, it's a narcissism problem. It's almost the opposite of a self-esteem problem. And now, that isn't to say that we should never notice our flaws. We, have to be, we need to be self-aware. We need to know that we have flaws, but we shouldn't spend all day noticing them. Did you notice that? The bit about noticing our flaws, about how when you notice them, you fixate on them. As a trans person, I can attest, yeah, that can be preoccupying. It can make you self-conscious, lead you to dislike those parts of yourself, not surface level things, I mean. Things like anger, things like not being what others want you to be all the time. These are both aspects I've personally shared with Matt. And do you know what else I've shared with Matt? I'm ADHD. Like defending introversion, Matt has time and time again returned to the well of criticizing ADHD. In his own words, he basically admits to having it and has attested as much in both multiple videos and blog posts, like this 2015 Blaze blog post. Quote, I'm very familiar with the symptoms. I've had them my whole life. Even now, I daydream all the time. I can't sit still. I can't concentrate on mundane tasks. I get lost in my own head. 
I forget things. I can't stay on one train of thought for very long. At this very moment, I have four different Word documents open on my computer and am working on four different posts at the same time. Three of them will never be published or completed. Ask my wife, she'll tell you all about it. Ask my high school chemistry teacher, who failed me once, made me repeat the class, then finally gave me an unearned passing grade the following year because he didn't want to deal with me again. Ask anyone who knows me. I have all of the, quote, symptoms, but I don't have a disorder because there is no disorder. There might be people with legitimate disorders who get labeled with this one, but this one, this specific thing we refer to as ADHD, is a godforsaken lie. I don't care who is upset by that statement, who will stop reading me because I said it, or how many angry and disappointed Facebook comments are coming my way. ADHD is a fraud. One thing Matt does here, and did in both the 2015 article and the 2020 video I'm about to show you, was lay to critics who would say, you don't know anything about ADHD, you don't have a kid who has it. Something Matt takes very personally in this video, before basically admitting, like above, that he himself has exhibited several traits of an ADHD diagnosis. So this, uh, well, you can't talk about that topic unless you've been personally affected by argument, is one of the most cowardly forms of emotional blackmail. It's just a way of shutting down discussion. It's a way of a person trying to win an argument by claiming this emotional trump card. Um, the, the assumption that, that, that people who have been personally affected by a certain thing must therefore be more knowledgeable about it and more credible when discussing it is obviously ridiculous. Just because you have car trouble doesn't make you a, it doesn't make you a mechanic, right? And if it did, we wouldn't need mechanics. So just because you've been through something doesn't mean that your opinions about it, whatever it is, are necessarily more true or more grounded in facts than someone on the outside. Now, I'm not saying that your personal experiences are worthless. I'm not saying that. Uh, I think that they're valuable to the conversation. I think they can add color, they can add perspective and so on, but they don't supersede facts and they don't supersede logic and they don't give you an exclusive right to have an opinion about a subject. Okay, that's my point. But as it happens, I do have experience. Oh, I, I have, I've already shared several times my own personal struggles with getting through public school as a, as a kid with, with this disorder. I was never diagnosed with the, with the disorder officially because that was not a direction that my parents were going to go. Uh, they were not looking to medicalize my academic problems. But I am familiar with ADHD. I have read the descriptions. I know what the symptoms are. And I see myself in pretty much every symptom described then and now listen to how he gets more passionate and louder as he continues talking about how he feels boys are treated unfairly in school in a video where he also criticizes how boys are overdiagnosed with adhd nobody ever stops and thinks oh, hold on a second. why is it that this if this is some neurological condition why is it so much more common in boys and why you know why does it seem to only really be a problem in the public school setting why do we have so much ADHD coming out of the public schools and not very much of it coming out of homeschooling? Why is that? Nobody ever stops and asks these questions. It's because we have taken, uh, we have taken boyhood and we have diseaseified it and medicalized it and we have slapped this medical label on it and called it ADHD. So it starts at a young age and then it goes all the way into manhood and, and adulthood and it just never ends. And we are destroying entire generations of men by telling them that there's something wrong with the fact that they are men. But then his justification is just saying it's biological and not questioning it. Um, my five-year-old son fits the ADHD label by any measure, as many five-year-old boys do. And that's the point. And that's not unusual because boys are much more likely to have ADHD than girls, which is a fact that people who believe in ADHD as a medical diagnosis, they never really grapple with this fact. Why is it, have you ever thought about why is it more common in boys? Isn't that a weird coincidence? That boys just so happen to be more rambunctious and energetic and more likely to run around and all that kind of stuff. And they also are more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD. Isn't that a weird, have you ever stopped to think about that? Does that not, doesn't that shake your faith in ADHD as a medical diagnosis a little bit? That it just so happens to be so much more common in the types of people who are predisposed anyway um, to, to, to be energetic and less focused? And these impassioned arguments are often intertwined with his criticism of how kids are taught and in his eyes over-medicated. And while that is a more nuanced discussion than Matt wants to have, and it may mean that ADHD is overdiagnosed or some kids don't actually need medication, those cases, if they're true, shouldn't lead to Matt's blanket statement that ADHD, something he himself seems to exhibit and causes issues in his life, doesn't exist. In another long-winded and branching video, Matt draws parallels between how boys are treated in education, making claims that it's set up to benefit girls, that school is boring. Society is set up in such a way to oppress women. Give me a break. They start their lives in the education system. 
The first 13, 14 years, they're formative years, they're in an environment that is tailored to them. Boys are more rambunctious. They have more physical energy. They're less able to sit still, less able to focus attentively on one dull task for a prolonged period of time. This again is biology. The typical classroom environment is torture for a boy. It penalizes him for being himself. It penalizes him for being a boy. As a result, boys get lower grades. As a result, boys are more likely to drop out. As a result, boys are more likely to be suspended and expelled. Perhaps worst of all, boys are twice as likely to be diagnosed with ADHD. Why, is, why do we never question this? By high school, 20% of boys, 20% are diagnosed. 20%. Yet we never stop to ask ourselves why boys are more susceptible to this mysterious mental illness or disorder. We never stop to consider that perhaps we are not so much diagnosing boys as we are diagnosing boyhood. See, if the school system were not predicated on sitting still and memorizing things, and it need not be, but it is, there would be no ADHD. But there's one bit in closing I really want to call attention to. Because like Matt's note about being in his head when we were discussing introversion, uh, this bit serves as something as a Rosetta Stone to why Matt finds the idea of ADHD truly distasteful. I mean, by his logic, even if he's out of school, why would he have a problem with the diagnosis? Why would he have an issue as an adult using medication that might help him with basic tasks he might have issues with? Because to Matt, it seems like a weakness. The point is, he could easily earn the label ADHD if we went, if we sought out that diagnosis. I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever that uh, my son could, could get that diagnosis. But we're not going to seek that diagnosis because the boy is not sick. He's not disordered. The boy is just a boy. He's more of a handful than some boys. He's less of a handful than other boys. He has his own personality. And I cannot imagine treating it like the manifestation of a mental disease. Besides, like, like almost every kid with an actual ADHD diagnosis, he can learn, he can focus. He just doesn't always learn the things we want him to learn in the ways we want him to learn them. If, 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 if my son was in public school, I have no doubt that they would probably tell us he has a learning disability. But he, 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 he's, he doesn't. He's, he learns all the time. He loves to learn. He just, he, just, he just likes to learn in his own way and about topics that interest him. And he likes to learn in a way that's more hands-on. I mean, the, the, the very idea that we take five, six, seven-year-old boys and we put them down in a classroom and we say, you need to spend the next seven hours doing busy work. And then when they struggle mightily to, to, to perform that task, we drug them. I mean, just think about that. Just stop and think about what we're doing. Who ever said that a seven-year-old boy is supposed to be able to do that? Did we ever stop to think that boy, that, that, that a kid like that just isn't supposed to be doing that? Now I know it well, but if he doesn't do that, we, we, we need him to do that because he needs to learn this very quickly so he can go to college and he can get a job at a nine to five and it's a cubicle and, you know, have a, you know, so we have his whole life planned out for him. We've got his life planned out for him. We, we know what the schedule needs to be. So you've got to learn this now, then learn that, then learn that, then do that. And we've got it all mapped out. Do we ever stop to think that our map is wrong? Do we ever stop to think that our map is self-serving? that this is what we want our kids to do and how we want them to act? It starts to come together that he sees this diagnosis as something medically wrong, as a sickness, and not just a difference. It seems to go back to his obsession with definitions, where if someone has a mental disorder, they're sick and less than or weaker instead of just different. Like he wants people to respect introverts and treat them how they prefer to be treated because he simply sees that as a difference. When in reality, it's likely tied to his ADHD, an innate chemical imbalance in his brain, a difference he was born with. On that note, and with Matt's love of definitions in mind, look at some other times he's talked about mental illnesses. And you really have to wonder, actually, where do the drug companies and the psychiatrists, where do they get their idea for what is normal? Because they're talking all the time about, well, that's abnormal, that's disordered. Okay, well, what is normal to you? What do you consider normal? What is, a, what is, what is normal behavior? What is a normal person? What are normal feelings and normal thoughts? What is a normal brain? Now here I think is the problem with uh, our whole approach to mental illnesses. And, and, and this, by the way, I'm not talking about brain diseases. A brain disease like dementia, where you can see the, the, the brain literally atrophy. Now that's very different from a mental illness. Um, and if a mental illness were a brain disease, then we wouldn't call it a mental illness. In other words, if we could definitively see that this mental illness is caused by something going haywire in the brain, and we could see that there's a, that there's a real disease in the brain, then we would just call it a, a brain disease. We wouldn't call it a mental illness. In order to, now to look at a person like, well, they aren't supposed to feel like that, or they aren't supposed to be like that. In order to make a claim like that, and that is an incredible claim to make, but in order to make that claim, you must have some idea of like the ideal person. So if I'm looking at something and saying, well, it's not supposed to do that, I must have an idea about what it's supposed to do. So um, I can look at a computer, and if I knew about computers, which I don't, but if I were an expert on computers and the computer was having a problem, I could say, no, that computer's not supposed to do that. 
And the reason why I can say that is because I know what a computer is supposed to do. And I can prove it for you. I can take a normal computer and show you, oh, no, this is what a computer is supposed to do. Here's what your computer is doing. Here's the, the you know, there's a disconnect here. And so here's how we can fix it. Still, you wouldn't be able to prove that the imbalancement causes whatever disorder because you couldn't prove that the imbalancement isn't itself caused by, say, environmental factors or life experience or any number of other things. So again, there are these enormous leaps of logic that are being made when we talk about mental illnesses. And we're just allowing the drug companies and doctors to make those leaps. And we're not even questioning them. But even if we were to put all this to the side, um, even if you were to accept just for a moment that brain chemistry determines everything about a person, um, and, and even if we were to accept that there is this chemical imbalance and the chemical imbalance itself does cause, say, ADHD or depression or whatever, that still wouldn't prove that a particular personality, like the ADHD personality, for instance, is disordered. It doesn't prove, in other words, that a person shouldn't be that way. You can practically see these two sides tearing at each other, where he wants this issue with his mind, including the issues that brought him in school, to be easy to understand, but it's just not. So he's tried to simplify it, to say he doesn't have ADHD because that would mean he's somehow sick. And here's where my own personal experience comes in. I was diagnosed from a young age as something different with me. The first few psychiatrists I was taken to declared me autistic until another said I actually matched ADHD. In an effort to help me, my mother got medication and took me out of public school. I was in a parochial school, a private Lutheran school from grade two to seven. Pivotal years for learning. And part of what Matt attests to is true in education, at least in my experience. My formative years didn't receive a cookie cutter public education where I had been in special ed because nobody knew what the hell to do with me. I didn't sleep during nap time, I hyperfixated, I got in fights, but in a small focused environment with one teacher and less than 15 students, I flourished. I was allowed to take time on certain assignments even as I buzzed through others. I was allowed to read at my own pace and those years were instrumental to me becoming a writer and speaker later in life. But you know what else helped? The medication. My mother was hesitant, she still attests, in the early 2000s there was a rampant fear of over-medicating. But then she saw the difference in how attentive I was, how much I flourished, could focus on the things that excited me. It also helped that my mother was understanding and did her best to foster my various hyperfixations that cycled throughout my childhood. And even in adulthood, I've struggled. I tried to go off meds when starting college, and my focus was a mess. I developed terrible eating habits and compulsions that led to me not focusing in my boring ass classes. Hell, even in high school, I can completely relate to Matt's stories of being bored, not understanding math, but being good at writing, and being introverted to the point of being made fun of. And as much as Matt likes to say how personal anecdotes don't come into an argument because I don't know what he's been through, I have a feeling that our experiences here are more similar than I initially thought they'd be. Granted, I only have a two-year degree. Like Matt, I was lucky enough to launch into some semblance of a career fairly early, and while I've been scraping by, I've made legitimate progress towards professional goals. But unlike Matt, I have a curiosity. I'm not as rigid in what I believe. I'm willing to learn, sometimes, if it might even affect my worldview. Something we will see shortly, Matt sees as another weakness. Despite his penchant for ignorance, Matt sees himself as pretty educated, judging by this 2012 blog post where he insults teachers for striking while negotiating better benefits. Quote, I'm pretty sure your students won't magically know how to read and communicate in grammatically correct sentences because you got yourself a bigger pension and decreased accountability. In fact, I'm quite sure that ancient Greeks produced the smartest and most revolutionary thinkers in the history of human civilization with the aid of nary a teacher's union. Actually, I'd even bet Plato figured out a way to educate Aristotle without once picketing for more vacation time or more donuts in the break room. Then again, my teachers were unionized, and I'm the guy that just dropped a brilliantly obscure historical reference, so maybe there's something to your claims. Oh, you noticed that, huh? Matt sarcastically calling his references to Plato and Aristotle brilliantly obscure, yeah? Despite not pursuing college, Matt does love to appear to know things. You can obviously pick apart the above paragraph for a litany of reasons, like the idea that education was the same for the Greeks as it is today, and you'd have a field day. One pretty humiliating example of Matt's confidence in his education is this well-known clip where he argues against healthcare for trans kids, and is then questioned on his educational credentials. Remember those arguments I mentioned that he loves to resort to? So trans affirmation causes the suicide rate, not the other way around. Last thing I'll note is that um, 
the suicide rate among trans identified people is, is sky high. It remains sky high. All the data shows this. It remains sky high even after surgery. And in fact, in the most reliable data that we have, it's uh, years after surgery when suicidality is the highest for trans identified people. That's the reality. Can you give us a summary of your educational background or your healthcare education and experience? Mr. Walsh, you recognize? My experience in healthcare? Your educational background. I'm just curious. You, 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 you've yeah. testified as to a lot of your own research. So I'm curious for what purpose you do that and what background you have to qualify you to speak to that. Well, my background that qualifies me to speak to this is that I'm a human being with a brain and common sense and I have a soul. And so therefore, I think it's a really bad idea to chemically castrate children. That is my experience. Um, also, I, I did. Now, it's true. I didn't, I didn't go to college, but I did go to school long enough to learn how to read so I can read the data for myself. And that's exactly what I've done. You know, if you're going to come before a committee and make mischaracterizations and misrepresentations, it's fair game for us to ask you your educational background and your foundational knowledge for making such characterizations. I just have to question, you know, some of your public policy, you know, expertise when, you know, I'm reading here, Singapore is able to have nice things in part because they execute drug dealers by hanging and arrest even petty vandals and thieves and beat them with a cane until they bleed. We don't have nice things here because we aren't willing to do what is required to maintain them. So, you know, with statements like that, I kind of have to question your public policy beliefs. And, you know, and you also stated there'd been no studies. Well, I'm sitting here holding a study from the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, from the University of Pittsburgh about the uh, suicidal disparities between transgender and cisgender uh, adults and children. Uh, so I think, you know, before you state things, you may need to know all the facts. One of my favorite examples of Matt's self-professed education and the fruits it's born is this blog post where he speaks to how important the church is. See also Matt's poor understanding of history in this paragraph where he makes broad generalizations, again, citing no sources. Quote, the church for centuries has been the driving force behind art, architecture, science, medicine, and political theory. I know Hollywood and your seventh grade history teacher taught you otherwise, but they're both peddling a discredited myth. Any historian worth his weight in research would not deny this. It can't be denied. Facts are facts, which is an unfortunate reality for liars and propagandists. End quote. And don't worry, I'll get to what Matt thinks of the church, including the infestation of pedophiles in Catholicism. Here we see again one of Matt's preferred tactics to bolster his arguments, the old, because I said so. He doesn't cite sources, or so much as an academic study from one of these historians. Nothing, nada. He just says something and expects his readers to believe him. Real quick, one last look at how Matt views education. College is and ought to be seen as a very specific course of action taken for specific and expressible reasons. Reasons like, I want to be a doctor, or I want to get into engineering. Okay, those are great reasons to go to college. Now, he obviously means this as an insult. White men without degrees, but who can buy boats or Trump's base. That's an insult. But what he's really saying is that Trump's base consists of people smart, creative, and ambitious enough to forego the college path and yet still achieve enough, achieve enough financial success to buy a boat. So to people like Chris, having a degree is a status symbol, right? Having even more pieces of paper, your master's, your PhD, whatever, gives you even more status. And that's all it is to him. That's all it is to people like him. Note in here how Matt specifically talks about college as just a piece of paper, which it can be. There are certainly diploma mills. But Matt seems to think that all anyone does in college is nothing. No, Matt. A lot of people learn. They, they learn from a diversity of subjects and about a lot of people. They learn to have curiosity about the world, how to seek and verify information, and how to test assumptions. All things Matt has no interest in. Matt Walsh is not a curious person. We will go into his various opinions on things like music, movies, and pop culture in a bit, but for now, suffice to say that Matt's pursuits of knowledge generally seem to extend to the things he's interested in. And while that can give a breadth of experience, it doesn't give depth. He seems to feel like he's an authority to speak on things like trans healthcare because he's read a lot of books, but does that really make him an authority when the only ones related to the subjects are pre-approved to fit his bias? Which, by the way, is the thing they teach you to avoid and interrogate in college literature classes. Now, Matt has convinced himself that his extremism, his lack of flexibility and empathy or understanding, is a good thing. Which brings me to Matt's extremism and what he really believes.
Remember when I talked about how Matt eschews the polite politics of yesteryear? He relishes labels like extremism, as in this blog post where Matt doesn't see a thing wrong with being called an extremist. Quote, I embrace the label of extremist, because these days it simply means I can sometimes commit the sin of coming to a conclusion, and when I walk down the street I generally have a solid idea of where I intend to go. On occasion I argue with the intent of proving a point. Every once in a while, in a moment of prideful delirium, I may even insist on the existence of things like truth and reality. End quote. Note here that Matt only gives one real example of how this works, and notice again, the very simple switcheroo for something much more complicated. He's labeling himself an extremist for something very simple, but will then apply the same logic to things that are not very simple or may require a longer, more nuanced answer than he cares to admit. Yet still, this is a steadfast rubric for him. If he sees something as truth or reality, he sees it as the only possible outcome, the only worthwhile extreme, and there's no room for other thought. Matt is subtly self-aggrandizing. He often draws comparisons to himself and the qualities he has in great men, but with just enough distance that he can always claim it was a joke. For example, if you want to know how else Matt sees himself, take a look at this passage from a 2013 blog post, also on extremists. Quote, when will we start to realize that the world is changed and revolutions are made by extremists, not milquetoast moderates? Extremists shape the world. They climb mountains while the in-betweeners are tripping over speed bumps. They transform society while the undecideds are too oblivious to notice. Maybe it's time we all decide on a few things, pick a side on some issues, formulate an ideology of some sort. End quote. Granted, this was a decade ago, so I will give Matt some leeway if he's changed his mind since then, but I don't think he has. He usually stands by what he says. So I worked at the station until I was uh, 25. For a couple of years during that period, I hosted a morning show where we often did flout the rules of political correctness, as was the custom on morning radio at the time. In their hit piece, Media Matters presents evidence that I used racially insensitive humor, that I told inappropriate jokes, that I engaged in lots of offensive activities. All of that, of course, is true. Um, they also accused me of physically abusing our radio interns by tasing one of them as a joke. That's also true. And I submit, still funny. They're also absurdly claiming that I advocated child brides and for that bit of defamation, they are using another segment from over a decade ago where we discussed the issue of teen pregnancy. And I pointed out that in the past, teen pregnancy wasn't considered a problem because people got married younger. I was attempting to highlight in an admittedly awkward and rambling way in my early 20s, riffing off the top of my head during a rock morning show to an audience of almost no one at the time, the fact that unwed pregnancy is a core problem that plagues our society and is still a problem even when the unwed pregnant person is an adult. They hope to force me to submit and apologize, at which point, of course, as it goes, they'll shoo me away with my tail between my legs, out of public view, out of the arena, off into obscurity. This is my punishment. You know, the life sentence they expect me to serve for trying to stop them from abusing and butchering children. I do not apologize. In fact, by all rights, you sick freaks should be the ones apologizing to me for lying and defaming me and doing it all because I'm trying to prevent you from sexually mutilating children. Matt wears his so-called beliefs like a badge of honor. This extremism is exactly where Matt falls in the political spectrum. By his own words, he doesn't believe in things like compromise or bipartisanship, as indicated in this 2014 blog post, Stop Rooting for Bipartisanship. Now, how can Matt justify writing off literally anyone who disagrees with him? By flattening every other viewpoint into a series of broad generalizations based on nothing but feelings. Like this post where he talks about how liberals love to thrust their beliefs on others. It's a sarcastic article in itself, but is replete with the broad generalizations that Matt specializes in. He's great at taking these generalizations and making up people to dislike, like this long-winded satirical post where he takes the point of view of an enlightened atheist. This is Matt's preferred tactic for argument, what I call the 2D perspective. It's flat. There's no depth to his arguments because these things he's arguing against have been flattened beyond recognition. Not arguing on the merits of his own stances, but insulting and degrading anything he thinks is stupid, often assaulting it in a brutal barrage until he feels smug satisfaction. Look, for example, at this video where he reacts to random TikTok people who criticize him. Of that thing at the same time. Matt Walsh is just going to be upset with people using micro-labels. What the f*** is this? See, he, he wants to have it both ways, where he hates the oversaturation of language with micro-labels, yet when something is not 100% consistent and precise enough, he gets mad at that too. Art sniffing mumbo jumbo. Now he's taking issue with micro-labeling, despite earlier <sighs> complaining that micro-labeling is not specific enough. You can't have it both ways. <sighs> you have to use umbrella terms, which are not going to be exactly precise. See, this is the other problem with your compulsive and incoherent labeling. You don't allow for variations within the labels. You pretend that you do. You pretend that you're all about variation. You embrace all kinds of variety, you claim, but you don't. 
Because the moment you notice a variation within a category, you create a whole new category for that variation. And you do this kind of thing everywhere in every context. The most obvious example, of course, is how you've eliminated masculine women from existence. Tomboy used to call them. You've erased that variation by labeling them trans men. He doesn't really address much of what they say. He makes a broad generalization that somehow tomboys have been done away with. It's a dog whistle, understood by his audience to be true that even more masculine women can't be women anymore because queer people want to turn them all into trans men, which is ridiculous. He obviously hasn't seen this. But facts don't really matter. It doesn't matter what arguments are actually on the table if Matt can make a broad dispersion that gives his audience a reason to laugh at his haters. This blog post gives a great idea of what he thinks of anyone who believes differently as he succinctly sums up what he calls the cult of leftism. Quote, the cult of leftism has many tenets and it demands full compliance with all of them, but nothing in its creed compares to the sanctity of their two great sacraments, child murder and sodomy. You must not question these, but tolerance alone will not be good enough. You must celebrate them too. You must worship at the altar. You must sing hallelujah at the mention of their names. You must fight for a society where infanticide and gay sex are awarded a protected and privileged position. When a man decides to kill babies for a living, you must call him a healthcare provider and a healer. When a man decides to announce to the world that he enjoys sex with other men, you must call him a hero and a pioneer. You must literally give him awards for his courage. Nothing less will be allowed. This might be a little extreme to say, but it's what Matt really believes. He sincerely thinks that because others oppose his worldview, a worldview that again we see here is bountiful in broad generalizations, that makes them a cult. The leftism is the, the worship of the self. It's the elevation of the self. Um, that's the only coherent kind of thread that I, that I think connects all of what we call leftism and wokeism and everything. And a lot of other people talk about whether they're socialist or this and that. And um, I think those labels play into it sometimes. But at, at, at bottom, at the root of all of this, it is a worship of the self. And it is like a religious worship uh, because they believe that the self, sort of the ego, transcends all boundaries and, and, and should submit to no control at all, including their own biological identity. They should be able to rewrite by, by force of their own will, right? And uh, now you might point out that, well, the worship of the self, that's also the definition of Satanism, and to which I would respond, I mean, yes, exactly. So maybe that's, maybe that's just an easier way of putting it. He has a habit of comparing his ideological opponents on the left to a death cult, seen also here in a 2021 video. He depicts people who disagree with him as totalitarian, evil, akin to a religion, a kind of theocratic fascism, even. They want to see another 60 million killed, and another 60 million, and on and on. Any attempt to stop the extermination or even slightly slow it down is met with anger so intense and irrational and shamelessly wicked that the only description that fits in describing it is demonic. I mean, that's the fact of the matter. The, these are the bad guys. These are always the bad guys because all throughout history, you know, there have always been people pointing to other groups of people and saying that those people are not real people and don't deserve to be treated as real people. And the ones doing the pointing are always the bad guys. Always. A few things here before we move on. Here Matt is giving support for the Texas abortion ban, saying that the left doesn't want it because they want to keep murdering babies. In reality, more kids are actually dying now as a result of mothers in Texas forced to carry to term as shown in this CNN story I'll link down below. In a heartbreaking story from this article I will link below, a mother recounts being forced to carry a baby that was going to be born stillborn to term. Quote, When Cassiano was 20 weeks pregnant, a routine scan came back with devastating news. Her baby would be stillborn or die shortly after birth. The fetus had anencephaly, a rare birth defect that keeps the brain and skull from developing during pregnancy. Babies with condition are often stillborn, though they may live a few hours or days. Many women who, around the country who face the prospect choose abortion, two obstetrician gynecologists told CNN. But Cassiano lived in Texas, where state legislators had recently banned most abortions after six weeks. She couldn't afford to travel out of the state for the procedure. Quote, you have no options. You will have to go through with your pregnancy, Cassiano's doctor told her, she claimed in the lawsuit. In March, Cassiano gave birth to her daughter, Halo. After gasping for air for four hours, the baby died, Cassiano said during her testimony on Wednesday. All she could do was fight to try to get air. I had to watch my daughter go from being pink to red to purple, from being warm to cold, said Cassiano. I just kept telling myself and my baby that I'm so sorry this had to happen to you. Good. I'm happy that we scared you. I'm happy that you're so angry and upset. It makes me very happy. 
because we speak for the children that you want to slaughter. We give voice to the ones that you want to silence. And we're being heard. We will be heard. Your pathetic, trembling fear is delicious. I love it. Because it means the bad guys are suffering a defeat that they very richly deserve. And if you were to say, well, Matt couldn't know things like this would happen. Yes, yes, he could, because it's been a major talking point of abortion rights advocates forever. If he's really so well read, he should know about this kind of thing, especially for somebody who is constant looking for headlines to bitch about. And I'm sure he does know. He just doesn't care. To say nothing of how the self-righteous crusade of Matt to strip people of medical rights has caused suffering that will only continue to multiply. Suffering he gleefully praises, apparently. This is another look into how Matt twists definitions. In this video, he wants to play victim to claim that abortion rights activists are obviously the villains because throughout history, there have always been people who were dehumanized. And yet, Matt has no problems casting dispersions and accusing others of being totalitarian in wide swaths. He has no problem dehumanizing others when it suits him. These are, these are weak, pathetic, despicable, uh, effeminate cowards, all of them. This is what Antifa does. This is their whole thing. Their only tactic, violence and intimidation. So if you say transgenderism is a mental disorder, which it is, they'll say, oh yeah, well, it's not in the DSM. Yeah, it's not in the DSM because you had it removed. You demanded they take it out. You, you kicked and screamed and stomped your feet until it was taken out. That's why it's not in there, as you well know. Now, I could cite uh, a thousand other examples, but there's no need. The point is plain enough. LGBT activists are the worst bullies in America. By far, it's not close. The prosecutor should be disbarred. The media who smeared Kyle as a white supremacist serial killer should be sued into bankruptcy. Their lives should be ruined. They should suffer. We should want them to suffer for it because that's justice. And that still would not even the score. And they aren't done. After the verdict was read on Friday, the, de the demons in the corporate media convulsed and screamed and vomited like a scene straight out of The Exorcist. Watching MSNBC on Friday, as I did for a couple of hours, purely for the entertainment, I have expected to see someone's head do a like 360 degree turn. They were apoplectic in their demonic rage. And if you have one side of the political aisle that this is how evil they are, and they have just so completely detached themselves from any semblance of morality, integrity, honesty, basic human decency, and they will do literally anything, literally anything to destroy the people who come against them. If that's where we are, then... Um... As it turns out, there are only so many ways to be a satanic whore. After a while, it gets repetitive, and, and we are way past that point today. But with that said, even if these degenerate pop stars are just vying for our attention in the most obvious, overdone ways because they have the IQ and creative talent of a paper plate, there is still a certain significance to the fact that a major broadcast network, uh, you know, broadcast a satanic ritual live on air last night. The left's cultural agenda is to tear down and desecrate all that you love and hold as sacred. They have no ideas of their own. They have no plan beyond the, the, the destruction. These are just a few of the innumerable examples of Matt dehumanizing the subjects of his ire, depicting them as devoid of morality and common decency, threats to civilization, and so on. While he rarely implicitly calls for violence against them, there's a subtext to calling certain people unfit for civilized society that many would say justifies violence if it were used against them, usually for advocating inclusion, equality, or opposing something Matt agrees with. Yet, these people aren't the totalitarians he loves to claim. Here's where Matt really gets his bread and butter, accusing others of being what he is. As we've seen in some blogs already, Matt covers many of his beliefs in a half irony that he can always back away from if he needs to. He can always say something as just a joke. So let's talk about Matt Walsh being a theocratic fascist. I'm happy that we scared you. I'm happy that you're so angry and upset. It makes me very happy. I'm happy that we scared you. I'm happy that we scared you. Matt Walsh loves definitions. He loves simply defining things, but he doesn't seem to love defining the words theocratic fascist. Instead, he constantly deflects with attempts at humor. Look, for example, at how he explains the fact that he put theocratic fascist in his bio. He just thought it was funny. Why does it say that in my bio? It does say in my Twitter bio that I'm a theocratic fascist. Uh, well, because a few months ago, someone sent me a message 
trying to insult me. Uh, and, and the message said, uh, hey, you know, you should put theocratic fascist in your Twitter bio because that's what you are. And I said, okay. And I did. And, and that's why it's there. That's the whole story. Now, you could interpret it one of two ways. You, you see theocratic fascist in my Twitter bio. You could, you could say, well, clearly that's a sarcastic joke, making fun of all the people who call him a fascist and a theocrat without knowing what either of those words mean. Um, so you could interpret it that way. Or you could say, oh, wow, he is literally a theocratic fascist who actually identifies that way on Twitter completely sincerely with no sarcasm. He also did a blog post about the same issue on The Daily Wire. But if you think that will actually address the label, you're wrong. He just keeps being sarcastic about it. Quote, this claim that I'm a theocratic fascist has been a prominent talking point among the protesters. The article in the student newspaper mentions it multiple times and the signs opposing my talk also highlight the point. It's true that I do describe myself in my Twitter bio as a theocratic fascist. I suppose you can interpret that description in one of two ways. As an obviously sarcastic joke meant to make fun of the people who reflexively label me a theocrat and a fascist for my opinions, or as a completely literal and sincere statement without the slightest hint of irony or sarcasm. Allow me to set the record straight once and for all. Of those two options, the latter is correct. I am in fact a theocratic fascist. My preferred system of government is a Christian dictatorship with myself at the head of it. From this position of absolute authority, I plan to impose my personal beliefs on the citizenry by force. Strict obedience will be demanded of everyone except my closest lieutenants, whose rampant lawbreaking I will overlook. Anyone who fails to bend to my every whim will be dealt swift and merciless justice." End quote. Matt doesn't love to actually address the deeper implications of his stances. Look at these videos, for example, where he takes a political compass test mostly to gain clicks. He just treats the whole thing like a joke. The freer the market, the freer the people. Freedom is overrated. So are people. So let's let's say strongly disagree. Abortion, when the woman's life is not threatened, should always be illegal. Strongly agree. But I'll be clear. This is not because every life is sacred and life has inherent value. That's not my point. My point is I want to control women. And I want all the women dressed in red bonnets. Matt loves depicting his enemies as overwhelmingly fascist control freaks who don't care about difference of opinion and want everyone to bow to their whims. When in reality, Matt is the one who's the gleeful extremist. His words, not mine. And while Matt likes to laugh at the term theocratic fascist, there's probably a reason he won't address those criticisms head on, despite his abiding love of defining things. Because much of that extremism comes from theocracy. And in his case, Matt's Catholicism. Matt uses his faith to justify things like why women shouldn't have abortions. This is what you find on the pro-abortion left. Leading the way are a bunch of people who really do love abortion. It's their high sacrament. They revere it. They bow before it. They have a, it is a high, holy, beautiful thing to them. And they have, they really have a reverence for it. And they approach it with a satanic enthusiasm. They need prayer. They can't be reasoned with. Okay, you, you can't argue with them. Only the Holy Spirit can change their minds by changing their hearts. But if God decides to hand them over to their depraved passions, um, then that's where they're going to stay. And we may have to figure out some other way to oppose them because they're beyond the reaches of debate or argument. Matt uses his faith in God, like many Christian conservatives, to basically say that, well, without God, we wouldn't have any moral code at all. As if moral codes and laws didn't exist in society until Christianity. Okay. If, if morality is only what helps people and immorality is only what hurts people, well, again, you haven't explained why I should care about hurting or helping people or why people are worth helping or why they're so valuable that I shouldn't hurt them. But even putting all that aside, what about the private and interior lives of people? What about everything that goes on inside me? Is all of that outside of the moral framework entirely? Is it completely morally irrelevant? What I think? Now, you may say that it is. Okay, well, let's take some extreme examples. Extreme, though, not at all, um, though, not at all uh, you know, fantastical. So take, for instance, a person who indulges in rape fantasies in his head. A um, person who doesn't just have a thought pop into his head about raping someone, but actually indulges the thought and enjoys thinking about it. Or take a man who indulges in pedophilic fantasies. Um, take even a man who watches child pornography. And I know there you might argue that watching child pornography is wrong because you are in some way supporting the child porn industry, which is true, so fine. But let's just say, hypothetically, you got a man who um, stumbles across a DVD lying on the street filled with child porn. He stumbles across a... Uh, a, a laptop that's got a bunch of child porn downloaded on it, and so he watches it. Now, you would probably, even as an atheist, I think you would instinctively say that he's wrong for watching. But why? It's not hurting anybody. People were hurt in the production of that pornography, but that's already happened. He isn't lending any material support to it whatsoever. He isn't practically adding to the misery of the victims. Um, so why is it wrong? And what about the pedophilic fantasies which he engages with in his mind? Or the man with the rape fantasies? Or a woman who sits around all day dreaming of all the violent things she'd like to do to the people that she hates? Again, I think instinctively, you'd say that these thoughts are wrong. 
and it's wrong to indulge those thoughts. But on what basis? It's not hurting it. And atheistic morality seems always, I mean, there's a million versions of it, but it always basically comes down to don't hurt people. It seems like basically everyone views morality in that way. They view it, in a word, as a transcendent thing. But there is nothing transcendent in a purely material world, which to me tells us that we are not living in a purely material world. So that's why I think um, objective morality is pretty good evidence for the existence of God. And other less talked about things, like how he apparently believes that the Bible should be taught in school. Like he literally doesn't think the separation of church and state exists. So that's what it means. Congress cannot make a law forcing you to accept or adopt any religion. That's, that's what the First Amendment is trying to tell us. That's got nothing at all to do with teaching the Bible in public school. Because you teach the Bible in public school, first of all, that's not Congress. Second, there's no law being passed. Third, no one is being forced to accept any religion whatsoever. So, so it's got nothing to do with what the First Amendment says. And the thing is, you can't really have a well-rounded education if it's divorced entirely from the Bible. It's just not possible. It really is impossible to have a well-rounded, a real and well-rounded education in America if you're just going to ignore the existence of the Bible. You can't do it. I mean, the idea that we could teach kids about Shakespeare without without them understanding the biblical themes that are dripping all over um, Shakespeare's works, it's just, it's just it's impossible. You would be hard-pressed to think of a great piece of writing that was written from about the year 90 to maybe the year 1900 that was not to some degree influenced by Old or New Testament texts. And obviously the New Testament didn't exist in the year 90, so that's what I'm saying. You know, Old or New Testament text, pretty much any great piece of writing, it, it, it would be very difficult to find one that is not in some way influenced. And a lot of it was heavily influenced by the Bible. You're going to have also a difficult time um, comprehending or appreciating Renaissance art. He also just goes on to make the argument that not teaching the Bible in schools would somehow mean that kids would have no idea what the Bible is. Like they'd have no context for biblical references, which is not the case. That's like saying an atheist couldn't understand the exorcist. His morality, which he himself attests he gets from religion, has led him to think things like pornography, which he basically always equates to prostitution, should also be banned. I mean, if you've been listening to the show for any length of time, you know that I'm in favor of banning porn outright. I would like to ban all of it because pornography is not speech. A person performing sex on film is engaging in something, all right, but it ain't speech. Porn is prostitution. Not everything is about consent all the time. There are also factors like good versus evil, right versus wrong. Th these things also must be weighed when we make laws. It, it, we have to take that into account. Nobody has a God-given right to heroin, and heroin is a noxious poison that destroys community. Thus, why not make it illegal? I'd say the same thing about porn. Don't let. Of course we legislate morality. What are you talking about? Of course we do. Everything that is illegal is illegal because we have decided that it's wrong. So every law we make, every single law we make is based on a moral conception. We can be wrong, okay? We have decided in this society that it would be, that it's good, in fact, that it would be evil to stop women from killing their babies and thus it is legal for them to kill the babies. So we can be wrong with our moral conceptions, but what I'm, what I'm establishing here is that there is no such thing as not legislating morality. That is a thing that doesn't exist ever anywhere. If a thing is illegal, it is because we have decided or the government's decided that it's wrong. If something is, is not just wrong, but evil, morally evil. If something is not morally evil, then it shouldn't be illegal. Simple as that. Oh, he basically also blames porn for boys who become predators and creeps. He feels the biological impulse to go out and find a sexual partner. This is biology. Though he doesn't understand this urge and his conception of human sexuality has been perverted and confused by the porn habit that he developed in sixth grade. The boy cannot escape sex. It's all over his computer. It's all over his phone. It's all over social media. It's all over the TV. It's all over the music he listens to. It's all over everywhere. It seems that everyone is doing everything they can to make a degenerate and a creep out of him, even as they demand that he be the opposite of that. We ask for self-discipline, self-control from the boy while providing him none of the tools to develop them. Rather than tools, we give him temptation, non-stop temptation, everywhere he goes, all day, every day, right at the moment when his brain is least capable of dealing with it. His religion has played a huge role in his critiques of pop culture, from films to music and plenty more. Matt doesn't like empathizing with others much. That also informs his political opinions on what shouldn't or shouldn't be allowed. For example, Matt advocates against people he doesn't like voting in this blog post. Or in this much later video where Matt still advocates against certain people's ability to vote because of a Jimmy Kimmel segment. You know, when you see these videos, the first thing that you think is, wow, these people vote. That's the really scary and depressing thing is that these people can't point to a country on the map, yet they go and vote. And my point is, and I know this, scene, this seems very scandalous and it's very upsetting um, to a lot of Americans with their modern sensibilities, I really believe that we need to find some way to legally stop these kinds of people from voting. We could see so many improvements in our system, in our culture, in our society, if we could just stop ignoramuses from voting. 
Like, look, I get those segments are dumb and frustrating, but they're edited to be that way. There's a reason they put like two minutes out and not the whole three hours of footage where people were wandering around talking to people. As seen with recent conservative freakouts like Bud Light and Target, Matt also has a long history of celebrating what he sees as the subjugation of those he disagrees with. It's because we said we don't want this disgusting stuff right in front of our kids. And now Target is saying, well, well we need to learn. It's a learning moment for us. Um, that represents them bending the knee to us for change. And you could always point out, well, I think they still have the pride stuff. They didn't even get rid of it at the time. They moved it to the back of the store. You know, it, it, do I think that come Pride Month next year that they're going to have no Pride merchandise at all, that there's going to be no rainbows? No, of course they're still going to have some of that stuff. But they're going to tamp it down considerably. And they're going to do it because we demanded it. That is a victory. The only way to stop the mob is to never apologize to it, to give it nothing, to make no concessions, to offend it on purpose just out of principle, and to laugh in its face. And I don't care how you feel. I don't apologize to you. Your feelings are irrelevant to me. I don't care if you have PTSD for the rest of your life because of what I said. I'll sleep like a baby tonight anyway. In fact, I'll laugh at you. I'm happy about it. I'm happy I upset you. I don't care about your feelings. And I'm not going to explain myself either. Don't like what I said? Deal with it. It's your problem. It's not mine. Now get the hell out of my face. You see, subjugation is the goal here. The end point of his smug self-assuredness. He wants victory, and I think that's because if he gets it, it will mean he will be definitively proven right. To himself, at least. He sees himself on the back foot of the culture war because almost everyone disagrees with him. And he wants to make everyone pay for that. If he can't do it through legislation, he'll do it through encouraging harassment and vilifying the things he hates. Now, as someone who's driven by theocratic principles, who openly advocates for oppressing people he doesn't agree with and doesn't like, who doesn't believe in compromise, it's not far off to call Matt a theocratic fascist, even in shorthand. On its face, he fits the definition pretty snugly. Much has been made of Matt Walsh being a self-described theocratic fascist, as stated in his Twitter bio, but Matt wears that badge proudly because he himself doesn't see him as a fascist. No, instead, he sees things like gay rights activists as the real fascists. He acts like it's funny that others would call him that, so he trolls by putting it in his bio, but that also serves a purpose to soften the blow that his ideological worldview may be conservative, but it is far from freedom-loving. Matt Walsh may love to tell the government what it shouldn't do when it comes to taxes and regulation, but he loves advocating what it should do when it comes to things he personally disagrees with. Again, as attested to by his ideas about extremism, Matt doesn't believe in more than one way to see the world. Not really, at least. Matt isn't a troll in the same sense most would understand it. He doesn't ever set out with the explicit goal of doing something to make someone mad through annoyance like those goofy liberal tears cups conservatives are so fond of. No, again, Matt is a true believer, and when his words inevitably piss somebody off, only then does he try to cover his tracks in humor. Until that point, everything he says is very serious, and he's been saying it to piss people off, but not half-heartedly, like the 4chan dum-dums you'll see type, uh, you'll never be a woman in my comments all the time. He's serious about being an extremist, suppressing others' voting rights, following theocratic doctrines for government, and banning health care he doesn't agree with. Until someone calls him a fascist for talking like one and acting like one. Then those things become a joke. It's funny that someone would call him fascist for just using facts and logic. It's funny that someone would call him transphobe of the year for simply trying to protect women and children. He's totally not mad, guys. He's definitely not mad when he gets outmaneuvered by people with more knowledge about a topic who dismantle him and his worldview. And Matt's tendency to turn his opinions into jokes is where we get the best insight into who he is as a person. Like mentioned above, Matt doesn't believe in bipartisanship, he doesn't believe in understanding or compromise. He uses that conviction to cast broad dispersions on anyone who might disagree with him, and then when they respond to his often cruel, exaggerated points with nuance, he simply wears that nuance as a badge of honor. The points he makes are simple, based on little more than conviction. He sees the world accordingly in a simple way, and ruled by simple definitions, but when the world responds to complicated issues in a way he doesn't like, he definitely doesn't get mad. For example, my favorite scene from What is a Woman? Throughout the documentary, which was made by lying to its subjects, by the way, Matt does his best to play a comedic straight man role while cutting his interviews and the subjects to look as ridiculous as possible. His goal with the documentary was never to ask real questions about trans people. As we can see, he's had his mind made up for decades. So he set out to make them look bad and make ideas about gender look ridiculous. If I didn't know better, I'd say Matt's own lack of education plays into this tactic. At some point, Matt seemingly decided that there was nothing more the world could teach him, and abandoned all curiosity except for World War II history books. 
For example, look back at the introvert article. Matt's approach to this article that has nothing to do with him personally is to take it deeply personal. And if you look closely, you see that a lot in Matt's critiques. It's probably a byproduct of his extremism, his need to take everything so seriously. But more than that, I think Matt can't help but take things personally and lashing out emotionally in the form of his constant jabbings. Maybe it's that anger issue he's worked on, but I have a sneaking suspicion that so much of Matt's worldview and his need to lash out is based on his own personal self-loathing. He likes to play the part of a calm, collected man of reason who chooses his words deliberately, carefully. But in choosing his wide assortment of platitudes, Matt betrays himself as someone who is deeply angry, an anger that he does his best to aim at the world around him. Hello everybody out there and thank you very much for watching. Now you may get to the end of this video and be like, hey Jordan, where'd the rest of the video go? But as I set out to uh, undertake this massive project, it grew larger and larger as if you couldn't tell by the sheer amount of videos of Matt I had to watch and source for this video, which I believe is somewhere around 50 alone. So in the interest of both time and effort, I've decided to split my dissection of Matt Walsh into two distinct halves. One focusing primarily uh, on his arguments and how he works around his arguments. And then the second half is going to be primarily focused on how he reacts to the world that reacts to his arguments and how he has basically locked himself inside a prison of his own mind uh, and is maybe one of the most self-loathing people in the conservative space. If you enjoyed this video and the hard, hard work I put into it, please consider giving a couple dollars at one of the links down below or signing up to my Patreon, uh, where you can get updates on videos like these as they're made, including sneak peek looks at how they're being made. And you get a whole bunch of other groovy little details and door prizes like uh, cosplay photo sets I've done and some uh, looks at books I'm writing and a whole bunch of other cool stuff. Also, if you enjoy my political content and you haven't been able to yet, please check me out on twitch.tv forward slash dead domain where I've been regularly keeping tabs on local hate churches and just some of the real, real dumbest stuff coming out of conservatism these days. With all that being said, I hope you look forward to the next installment of this video. I'm going to be taking a little bit of a break from Matt Walsh, because like I said, this video alone, I sourced about 50 different videos of his, so I'm I'm a little burnt out. So look forward to a gaming video next, uh, of course, in between some stream highlights, and then uh, hopefully next month, and in the coming weeks, I'll be able to get back on the Matt Walsh video for a part two and finish it up. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching, and I hope you have a great day.